Hello, I'm chemist John Pendleton. In this uh, one today, we're going to begin out w w with the movie Jurassic Park. Ah yes, Jurassic Park. Entertaining and informative. Now in the movie Jurassic Park, and by the way, basically just about any movie you see, uh, made by Hollywood or wherever, the purpose of their movies is not to follow what is history, what is science, what is the truth. They make a movie to make money, okay? What? You, you mean the Avengers didn't defeat Loki? Are we still in danger? And so, just because there was in a movie uh, like Jurassic Park is that all of it is true. There's some stuff in it that was true. What was in it that was true? Fortunately, I've actually watched it again recently, and I have to say that probably the only thing that's actually true in there is that the dinosaurs they show actually existed. And even with that, by the time of the film's production, the scientific community had accepted that velociraptors were only a foot and a half tall. So, And of course, with our first transparency here, the idea was to find a mosquito that had sucked dinosaur blood and became trapped in amber. Amber is that sticky tree resin that we believe washed down with the flood. Whoa, that came out of nowhere. You gonna provide any more context or explanation for that? Anything? And insects became trapped in there and then it became petrified or fossilized in that clear crystalline form called amber. Okay, so you're not giving us any more about how amber came down in the flood. So I guess we might as well just move on to the new claim. We talked about this in episode one. So I know that you know that fossilization takes a long time. And I also know that you know that things that look kind of sorta like fossilization to the untrained eye, like calcification, don't count, and don't demonstrate that amber forms quickly in the face of the evidence otherwise. Now that was a movie. It is not the truth. Um, yeah, actually it is. That's another thing that was true in Jurassic Park. Insects actually are found trapped in amber. What's not true is that you can extract nice complete dinosaur DNA from them and make a bunch of new dinosaurs. Also, I gotta say, I've always found it hilarious how you're so skeptical of movies and drawings and magazines and scientific journals and UFO museums. Just about every form of art and media in existence, but you never really seem to be skeptical of books. Or, for that matter, creationist websites. What is the truth is this next picture. They have found Tyrannosaurus rex bones that are not completely fossilized. They're not completely turned into stone. Hold on, asshole. Why did you just spend all that time talking about how insects aren't actually found in amber? and then not make a point. You can't just talk a whole bunch and then not make a point and then move on to Tyrannosect bones. There's still parts of it that are like fresh bones. Now first of all, if that's the case, how long ago did that dinosaur die? Millions of years ago? Uh-uh-uh. Not that long ago. Some hundreds or maybe a couple thousand years ago, but not millions of years ago. And look at this. Under a microscope, they have found little red globules. Every test to present indicates we indeed have found real dinosaur blood. I guess you're talking about the Schweitzer et al. discovery of soft tissue in dinosaur bones, and please, in the future, cite it when that's what you mean. That is amazing, and that is devastating to the belief that dinosaurs became extinct 65 billion years ago. They died out if they died out at all completely. Let's take a little closer look at that. So you're saying that the soft tissue that was found within the fossils proves that this fossil was not from 65 million or more years ago, but rather that it was from a few hundred or a couple thousand years ago. Okay, first thing, you successfully failed miserably in episode one to demonstrate that fossilization can occur quickly. You successfully demonstrated that if you leave a boot in a stream, it can get calcium all over it, but that's about it. So. Fossilization is a long, slow, gradual process. Secondly, 
We're not talking about whole pieces of bone that are unfossilized here. We're talking about small samples of soft tissue inside the fossils. This is under layers of dense minerals. Now I'll certainly grant that under the conventional view of fossilization, this wouldn't happen. Now this finding is still controversial within the scientific community, but if we assume that it's true, there's something going on here that we don't quite understand. The dense minerals could have provided some protection to the soft tissues inside, allowing some of them to survive the fossilization process. But there would have had to have been some kind of extra geological or environmental process there that is not yet understood. Now since you're saying that these fossils of dinosaurs are all a few hundred, a couple thousand years old, let me ask you this. Why is it that when we find the bones of a human or any other animal that are a few hundred or a couple thousand years old, they're not fossilized, but when we find the bones of a dinosaur, they are always fossilized, including the Schweitzer dinosaur, which was completely fossilized except for possibly a little bit of soft tissue, which regardless of whether it's true or false has no effect on whether the dinosaur itself is fossilized. Are dinosaurs somehow special? They die and then they just magically turn to stone? Now, in the biblical record, we have the, the, relate the story of creation in six days. And as we mentioned earlier, God made on the fifth day all of the sea creatures and the birds. And so that would be a time that God would have made the marine dinosaurs. Are you serious? Marine dinosaurs? Yeah, bet you can't name one since they never existed. You're not making a very good case for yourself being an expert on dinosaurs who I should listen to, considering that you don't even realize that those marine reptiles you're talking about were not dinosaurs. And the pterodactyls, the flying reptiles or flying dinosaurs. No. Dinosaur is not a synonym for reptile. And on day six, he made the land animals, as well as Adam and Eve, and there would have been land dinosaurs. Now we saw in the first conference that dinosaurs originally were herbivorous. Actually, in that conference, we learned that herbivorous is actually a noun. So I think in that conference, we actually found out that dinosaurs were herbivoruses. They were not meat eaters. They were vegetarians, if you please. And so there was no uh, danger of them eating Adam and Eve. I can really tell I'm going to enjoy the second and third parts of the Dinosaur Trilogy and the second and third parts of the Flood Trilogy and so on in your series because you're attempting to build off of premises that I've already looked at. I don't even have to do anything. All I have to do is say, your premise fails, jackass. That claim was in episode two, by the way. Now, this is the cover from a rather liberal magazine. And on the, on the cover, the man is saying to the woman, what, he told you that dinosaurs existed on the earth at the same time as man? Yeah, he called it uh, creationism. It's the latest in scientific findings. Now, this magazine was not at all in favor of that fact. And so they had to kind of poo-poo the whole situation. Uh, okay. Did you have a point? Why is it that 50% of the things you say don't lead anywhere? At least if you're building up to a bad point, you've tried to make a point. Now, we want to go to Texas, uh, south of Dallas-Fort Worth, southwest, uh, to a town about 80 miles from there called Glen Rose. Next to Glen Rose is a state uh, park called Dinosaur Valley. In that park, they have found over 2,500 dinosaur footprints in Cretaceous stone. Now, let's take a little step back. Why did they put the name Jurassic Park as the name of that movie? Because Michael Crichton, who wrote the original book, was a novelist, not a scientist, and he thought it sounded cool. I would have put the name Dinosaur Park, because there were all kinds of dinosaurs. What does Jurassic Park have to do with it? You already discounted this movie as just being for the money and for fun. Why are you mentioning it for a second time in a video that's meant to demonstrate that creationism is true? It's a fucking popcorn flick. Well, if you remember when we saw the geological time scale, there's actually three periods that they say pertain most to dinosaurs. Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Those are the names for the levels of the rock. That was really weird. It was like you were actually trying to educate people on what different geologic periods are. I thought education was against your religion or something. 
Maybe you should go pray just in case. Well, in this area of, of central Texas, by Glen Rose, there's a lot of Cretaceous stone. And in the Cretaceous stone, they have found these dinosaur footprints. John spends forever talking about how these dinosaur footprints in Dinosaur Valley were unearthed. How the Paluxy River eroded it down and revealed the footprints underneath. I'm going to skip all that because it's one of the most boring things I've ever heard. But I just wanted to give you some context from when he jumps into this part. Here's one also from the dinosaur, uh, the Paluxy Riverbed. You can see the different dinosaur footprints here in the stone. Notice here on the left side the overlay of stone that had to be lifted off. Uh, once they found some prints, they began going over and lifting up the succeeding overlays and found these dinosaur prints. Notice also in the front of the photograph the ripples there that are preserved in stone. I believe they're the beginnings of Noah's flood. And there was a movement of water that made ripples in the, in the mud and then a ton of mud fell on top, sealing in uh, those ripples and footprints. Okay, so you're looking at a grainy ass photograph and you're saying, that looks like a ripple. That must have been caused by Noah's flood because the Bible says there was a flood and I want evidence for it. Well, firstly, if I'm looking at the same thing that you are, it looks more like a ridge than a ripple, considering the shadow. Have you actually looked at it to see if maybe it's been chipped away by a tourist or if there's rock underneath? Or maybe, because you say that layers had to be removed to expose the footprints, that ridge is a remnant of the removal of the mud layers over top of the footprints and they didn't bother to cut it off nicely because it's nowhere near the actual footprints. It could be something like that. You've done no scientific investigation at all and you're jumping to the first religiously informed conclusion that you can think of. Now for the sake of argument, let's say that there's no evidence of tampering or of accidental damage. There's no evidence that there's rock under it. What do we have? There's mud with a ridge. You're claiming that this was because water rushed over the mud. So let's say that water rushes over the mud, the mud dries out, and then some more mud gets on it. Note that the mud would have had to dry out first because a foot of mud on top of a little ridge of mud is just flat mud. So you have a global flood with the world covered in hundreds of feet of water, and you have a little ridge of mud caused somehow by the flood rushing over it, which then dried out during the flood, and then had mud put on it by the flood. What's more, this place where you're proposing that this happened due to the flood is in a riverbed. What happens in riverbeds? Water rushes over things, flood or no flood. You are an idiot. If you go to Dinosaur Valley State Park, as you're going along that small county road, you'll go right in front of the Creation Evidences Museum. Evidence, 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 not evidences. Evidences is not a word. What is it with creationists and this made up word evidences? I've been there on three occasions and every time I'm impressed and I learned new things. I'm sure you were impressed, but trust me dude, you didn't learn anything. Now this photograph was taken in the museum. This is one dinosaur footprint. Then John takes 30 seconds to say, some dinosaur footprints are almost a yard across. Wow! No point. Now, though they've discovered a number of dinosaur footprints on private property, they found dinosaur footprints also. And they have located human footprints. You say, now just a minute. I sure do say, now just a minute, because that's absolute bullshit, and we've talked about one of these claims before. Well, it looks kind of like a human footprint. Yeah, okay. But if you actually look at it, for one thing, where are the other footprints? And for another thing, if you actually look for the features of the anatomy of the human foot, they're nowhere to be seen. Go figure. A main course of pareidolia with a side dish of dishonesty. Now, let's do a little experiment. Everybody raise your right hand. Ugh. Other right, John. Now, with your thumb, touch your fingers one by one to the other fingers. Okay, do that again. Okay, good. Now, put your hand down. Now, with your right foot, touch your big toe to all your other little toes. Anybody do that? Would you please leave the room? You belong to another species. I find it offensive for you to suggest that members of other species cannot watch your program. They have just as much of a right to watch it as we do. You see, what this is, is a human footprint. Humans have two hands and two feet. The monkeys or apes have four hands. What we call feet are actually like a hand. 
This is definitely a human footprint. This is the footprint that you're talking about. That looks more like a poorly drawn cartoon footprint than a human footprint. And your evidence for why this is a real human footprint is not comparison with real footprint anatomy, but rather that it doesn't look like a chimpanzee footprint. Is your point here that if it looked like a chimpanzee footprint, it would make sense to the scientific community as living with the dinosaurs? Is that your point? Because it kind of sounds like that's your point. Well, I guess I can't be too mad at you, because like I said, if you're building up to a bad point, at least you tried to make a point. Here's a, another footprint in stone where somebody put their foot fit exactly to the form of the footprint in stone. Yeah, clearly that's an exact fit. As we can clearly see if we look through the foot that's sitting in the hole. Now, it's very impressive that in one area there's a whole bunch of dinosaur footprints in Cretaceous stone. In another area there's some human footprints in Cretaceous stone. That's impressive enough in itself. Geez, that would be impressive. Do you have any actual human footprints? I guess you must be starting small, right? Because so far all you've shown are pictures of not human footprints and a picture of some person's foot in a hole that's kinda sorta shaped like a human foot. So I sure hope you have more, because I really don't think you have enough data to publish. But more impressive are these footprints. Here we have Cretaceous stone, and in the front we see a dinosaur footprint, and just 18 inches away is a human footprint in Cretaceous stone. Okay, you know what? I don't even see where you're trying to say that there's a human footprint in that picture. Like, at least with the other ones, I could see what you were looking at and kind of picturing it as a human footprint, but with this one, I don't even know what you're looking at. What does that mean? All I can think of is that it means you're desperate for evidence, and that desperation has made your imagination so overactive that it will see evidence in pictures that don't even kind of sort of look like they have any in them. Couple more? Okay. Please, no. The man on the right here in the blue shirt is pointing to a dinosaur footprint, actually it's a trail, that goes from top to bottom on the page. The man on the left in the yellow-orange shirt is pointing to a human footprint, a path that goes from left to right on the page. Okay, dude, you know, if you're gonna use pictures so terrible that I can't even see the dinosaur footprints you're fucking talking about, you should stop and think about how to make your production quality good enough for people to actually see or cite your fucking source so I can go look at the picture on some website where someone knows how to use technology better than to make their images look like they've been fed through a blur filter 50 times. Until you start doing one of those two things, why the fuck are you wasting my time? Here's another series of prints. I'm not wasting my time on this anymore. I actually managed to find some of the pictures of this site, the Taylor site. But you know, for one thing, I'm bored of this, here's a print, there's a print, everywhere's a print. And for another thing, why am I the one who has to tell the audience what they're seeing? You know what? Talk Origins, link in the description, breaks it all down, dinosaur tracks, blah blah blah, people go read it, decide for yourself, whatever. Link also in the description to bible.ca, it has pictures and descriptions of some of the different claimed tracks that John has mentioned, and other ones that he hasn't. John, I'm sick and tired of your fucking prints, and let's move on to something else. I know you have more. You always have more. Also found in that area was this human handprint in Cretaceous stone. Ugh. I fucking hate you. Well, hey, at least it's not a fucking footprint, right? And hey, it actually looks like a handprint. Well, that's an impressive start. Geologists have verified this is Cretaceous stone. This is one of a bunch of supposed human fossils that Carl Baugh puts forward. And I've heard enough about him in these videos that I might have to take a look at his stuff afterwards. But what it comes down to is, Carl Baugh doesn't like his specimens to be observed. And when he says, geologists have confirmed it, or it's been confirmed with x-rays at laboratories, what he really means is, hello, I'm a scientist and I have a lab coat. There aren't even any pictures of this handprint in the supposed Cretaceous rock that it was taken from, nor is there anything else to suggest that it's actually from Cretaceous Rock. All we have to go on here is Carl Baugh's word. And frankly, after the whole Piranhas thing in episode 6, I believe, of this series, I am not much inclined to trust Carl Baugh's word. Now what I think happened was, it was beginning to rain for the first time in history at the start of the flood. This person got scared, was running for higher ground, somehow tripped, was falling, put their hand out to break their fall, but since it rained some, the ground was kind of soft, left that print in the mud, 
and took off. Well, they died in the flood. Wait, what? It rained for the first time in history? So it had never, ever rained before the flood. All the plants, all the people who need to drink, it never rained? Where does it say that in the Bible? Damn, man, I mean, I at least get taking stuff out of the Bible that somebody else made up and thinking it's true, but just making up your own shit like it never rained before the flood, and then believing it because it sounds, well, stupid? That's pretty out there. Oh, and by the way, if the ground was soft when it started raining, and this person slipped and fell and put their hand in the mud, when the rain started coming down in an absolute torrential downpour, and rushing around and carving the Grand Canyon in five minutes, how did this handprint in soft mud stay there? I could go on for hours about this. This is one of the most unbelievably stupid things that I have ever heard. Anyway, uh, but that then some mud came in, sealed that over, and preserved it. Again with this, some impression or shape was made in soft mud, and then a bunch of mud came in on top of it and preserved it. Dude, have you ever poured out a bucket of mud and then poured out another bucket of mud on it? Seriously. The only option here, even if your soft mud handprint could survive the torrential rain of the flood, is that it dried during the flood and then had mud dumped on it to preserve it. Enough mud to resist the rain of the flood. I can't express how stupid this is. Also found in that area is this hammer. You just love to suck Carl Baugh's dick, don't you? Another one of his. On and on with Carl Baugh. Carl Baugh, Carl Baugh, Carl Baugh. Not that you ever seem to mention his name. Now a couple things about this hammer. Number one, its artistic style is pretty recent. Number two, in episode one of Hello, I'm a Scientist, you showed me a bunch of different natural fossilization types, one of which, or similar, this most likely is. This is supported by the fact that the piece of rock that was holding the hammer was not actually part of the main rock. So whether the piece of rock it was connected to was Cretaceous rock or crack rock, it doesn't make a difference. Number three, Carl Baugh has never allowed the wood of the handle to be carbon-14 dated. If the wood of the handle were tested, it would show us the accurate date of when that wood was alive. And the likeliest scenario is, of course, that it would show that the wood was alive, say, one to two hundred years ago. Or, in fact, to be accurate, I should say that the wood was alive earlier than the minimum range that carbon-14 dating can actually test, since this appears to be an old mining hammer. Carl Baugh wants us to think more on the order of the low thousands, around the time of the supposed flood. So he definitely doesn't want to let that get tested. Another interesting artifact is this fossilized finger. Hmm... I wonder who proposed that this was a finger. That's a tricky question. Wait a minute, no it's not, it was Carl Baugh. And guys, like all these other boring ass fake fossil Carl Baugh bullshit claims, it comes down to the same thing it always does. Nobody needs to prove that it's not a Cretaceous fossil finger because Carl Baugh has never demonstrated that it is. Particularly, just like the handprint, he has never provided evidence that it actually came from Cretaceous rock. So even if it were tested and shown to be a real finger, Carl Baugh still has all his work ahead of him because he still has to prove that it came from Cretaceous rock. Of course, from what I gather from John Pendleton's videos, Carl Baugh is not a man keen on rigorous scientific effort. So somehow, I doubt that any of the work that's still ahead of him will ever get done. When we go into caves sometimes, where people used to live, we find different drawings on the caves or canyon walls. What kind of drawing could an uh, archaeologist find that would scare him? GW in the shower? Ugh. Well, if he saw drawings of dinosaurs and pterodactyls, it would scare him to death. Why? Because it goes against his belief system. If they actually found cave paintings that really appeared to be of dinosaurs, the first thing that would necessarily have to be called into question is their authenticity. Simple scientific responsibility requires that any new evidence has its authenticity questioned, is examined, and is confirmed. But to maintain scientific responsibility at this point, the authenticity of these artifacts would have to be established extremely carefully. And the reason for this is the sheer amount of evidence in favor of the idea that humans never lived with dinosaurs with a 60-some-odd million-year range in between. 
The evidence supporting this theory is truly staggering, and if this one piece of evidence were found that was purported to go against it, it would have to be subjected to extreme scrutiny to have any chance of reasonably tipping the scales in favor of the hypothesis that humans actually did live with dinosaurs. Now I mentioned that the cave paintings would have to be clearly and obviously of dinosaurs. This means that ideas such as it being a poor painting of a different animal, or a painting of something else that is interpreted by the viewer as a dinosaur, or even the idea of it being an interpretation on a dinosaur skeleton that was unearthed at some point in the past, would actually have to be discounted first, because these are simpler explanations as to why such a picture might be discovered. Occam's razor of course proves nothing in and of itself, but it is a useful tool, and we should consider the simplest explanation first, before we move on to seriously considering more complicated ones especially when the simpler explanation fits the massive number of current facts and does not require a contradiction. With all that said, let's say that we could establish beyond all reasonable doubt that it was an authentic cave painting of a dinosaur that someone had seen face to face. Then the archaeologist in your example would not feel so much fear as he would feel elation at the fact that he is about to be made famous by the scientific community. We have this cave in Europe the Bernafall Cave, in which you can see by the diagram below, up on the rock, a mammoth is butting heads with a dinosaur. Okay. Wow. You start out immediately with what I really hope is your worst piece of evidence. Why didn't you save this for last? That is not even a carving. I mean, it's actually not a carving. Remind me, John, what was it I said earlier about a main course of pareidolia with a side dish of dishonesty? And you know what, just for laughs, let me go back and take another look at that picture that you showed. The one that's supposed to show the actual shape once you actually find it in the rock. Holy crap! Why are you wasting your audience's time with this? Not to mention mine. I have to believe, for the sake of my sanity, that even the most dumbass creationist would look at this and tell you to try again. Interesting thing about this cave, it's closed. You can't get in to see what's in there. Why not? Because they don't want us to know that men and dinosaurs live together because it goes against what they've been teaching us and, and continually saying that men and dinosaurs didn't live together. John, somehow I don't think there's a massive scientific conspiracy to keep you out of Bernafall Cave to keep you from seeing the randomly formed rock shapes that you think are carvings. Now, in Utah, in the Natural Bridges National Monument Park, there's a number of interesting things to see there of natural bridges, but in one of the canyons, there is this drawing on the, cave, on the canyon wall. You can see here the head, long neck, four legs, and long tail. Looks just like a dinosaur. I don't know why you felt the need to horizontally flip the image, but okay. Now it's actually fortunate that I'm making this in 2013 and not say 2010, because until 2011 the scientific community had offered no alternate explanation for this petroglyph. So of course, with no alternate explanation, the creationists clung to this and said, well obviously if you don't have another explanation, then it's a dinosaur. Now I mentioned before some ideas about conditions that would have to be met for one of these paintings to be considered authentic and actually of a dinosaur. Phil Center and Sally Cole in Paleontologica Electronica published a paper with similar conditions to establish the authenticity of this so-called dinosaur. I'll link the paper below, but I'll briefly summarize the conditions and the findings about those conditions. The conditions are, one, that the image is a single image, not a composite of separate images, two, it depicts an animal, three, its features cannot be reconciled with an interpretation that it depicts a member of the non-dinosaurian local fauna that was contemporaneous with its makers, i.e. it's not just a drawing of a different animal that people are thinking looks like a dinosaur, four, its features depict a specific identifiable dinosaur, and five, it is entirely human-made. Now you can read the paper and judge the methods for yourself, but the results are that this image does not satisfy the predictions that it is a single image, that it depicts an animal, or that it is entirely human-made. Let's move on. In the Grand Canyon, there are many uh, drawings that uh, the Native Americans had made years and years ago. Buffalo and deer and warriors, corn, snakes, things like that. And in one of the places, there's this particular drawing that looks very much like an Edmundsaurus, a type of dinosaur. Oh, wow. Yeah, cool. Um, couple questions. 
Why are you showing the same dinosaur that we just got done discussing? Why are you showing images of someone drawing it on a piece of paper and masking taping it to the rock? And why do you not know that an Edmonsaurus, or an Edmontosaurus, as everyone but you calls them, looks like this, and nothing like this? I don't know, just a few concerns. Maybe it's nothing. In another canyon wall, there is this drawing of some winged creature. Now notice his wings are not like that of an eagle, but they're more like this one of a pterodactyl. Alright, so I've looked around, I've tried to find better quality images of this cave painting, and I've tried to figure out where it's from. The only thing I've found is this image, which is slightly better quality. I still don't know where it's from, I don't know anything about it, so I'm just gonna have to go based on what you tell me. Now you're telling me that this does not look like a bird, but it looks like a pterodactyl. Now I'm looking at this, and I'm trying to figure out how exactly this looks like a pterodactyl and not a bird, and I just don't see it. I mean, it looks like a crane to me, or something similar. You're gonna have to explain this a little better. That, uh, you're flying dinosaur, or flying reptiles. You're killing me, John. Because it has like a membrane. They drew what they had seen. Seriously? That's as detailed as you're gonna get on this? The long vertical crane-like neck? The long crane-like legs? No justification for why those are there. You're saying its wings are like a membrane. I can't even see what its wings are like, frankly, with this image. And if primitive people painted monochrome pictures in caves, do you really expect them to draw in feathers every time with their one color? In 1890, in West, uh, in Arizona, a couple cowboys were out on the range and saw a large winged creature take off on the horizon. They rode over there and shot it and killed it, cut off the tips of its wings, and it was reported in the Tombstone newspaper. Probably the last living Quetzalcoatlus uh, at that time. Now you're getting into cryptozoology, and just so you know, this is basically like trying to demonstrate that Bigfoot exists. The April 26th, 1890 edition of the Tombstone Epitaph is supposed to have had an article about a Thunderbird. Now people who are interested in cryptozoological claims can go look it up for themselves. Like I said, Tombstone Epitaph, Thunderbird, Suffice to say, it's one of those times where nobody has the article, nobody has a picture from it. It's one of those claims that just floats around and everyone who's into cryptozoology just takes it for granted. But anyone who actually wants to see the article itself is pretty much shit out of luck. So what's next? Nessie? Now in <clears throat> the south of the Soviet Union, they found a high plane where they found over 3,000 dinosaur footprints. With those, they never had any problem. The problem began to rise and they began to find also human footprints mixed in with the dinosaur footprints. You have got to be fucking kidding me. We're back to this again? Dinosaur and human footprints. Why didn't you put this in the other section so I could have got it all over with at once? Now, what can we expect from these people? Are they going to change their way of thinking? Of course not. What are they good at? Making up fascinating stories. Man, they really are, you know. I heard this one about a Thunderbird. Wait, which people are we talking about again? And so in 1995, in the newspaper Pravda in Moscow, came this reporter's comments on the human and dinosaur footprints together. He wrote, Because we know that humans appeared much much later than dinosaurs. It was an extraterrestrial that walked in his swimming suit on the ancient seashore. Isn't that fantastic? Rather than face the fact that humans and dinosaurs live together, they have to make up some incredible story. Okay, for one thing, that piece of article that you quoted had no in quotation marks, as if he was being sarcastic. Because we know that humans appeared at a much later time than dinosaurs, so this guy was on your side. He's not some person making a claim that extraterrestrials were walking on the seashore. As a matter of fact, it sounds like he was trying to use that to mock people who said it was anything other than human footprints. Like, look, it's obviously human footprints. What are you gonna say it is otherwise, an extraterrestrial in a swimsuit walking on the seaside? So don't try and put the sarcastic words of some reporter into the mouth of the scientific community. Hee 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 hee. Sorry, I just left that there because people were complaining that John's too boring. Now, one of the things that I want to encourage you in all of this is that 
<clears throat> that verse that's been a blessing to me, Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. Oh, I think I understand now why you do these videos. He that wins souls is wise. So you think that if you win souls, you'll become wise. In my head, I'd be scratching while my thoughts were busy hatching if I only had a brain. Now here John spends forever telling a story about how he converted 10 people to Jesus by talking about dinosaurs in church. That was a turning point in my ministry in 1998. God spoke to me and says, you know, John, it doesn't make any difference. If we use dinosaurs to get people's attention, to answer their questions, to help them see that science is in agreement with the Bible, that the Bible had it right first. We can make a, 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 a transition that goes into the gospel of my son Jesus Christ. And if they get saved, let's do it. Sometimes I don't really know what to say in response to you. This time I just have too many options. I could go the angle of saying if God is omniscient, how come he doesn't know what science is? I could gently ask, so do you actually hear God's voice speaking to you? We have a nice padded hotel room for you here. Or, I could ask why your god sounds like a sleazebag marketing executive approving an ad campaign. Anyway, at this point, John continues on his masturbatory rant about all the different people he's managed to convince, and how all these different religious people are so thankful to him for giving them this message about dinosaurs. And he managed to convince a hundred students to pray. And one of the teachers. Yes, and one of the teachers, I'm sure you're very proud. I thought pride was a sin or something. And so the stories begin to multiply over and over. This message is so important because as, as we have in our, our verse there in, in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. So is that why you're always stumbling over yourself in these videos? You're fearful and it causes you to fuck up? Where are, dra where are dinosaurs mentioned in, in history? With a different name, they're called dragons. I'm gonna stop you right there. The existence of dragon myths does not mean that dinosaurs lived with people. That's simply ridiculous. The closest that I would possibly give you is that ancient people may have found dinosaur fossils and built myths around them. Not only that, but there are plenty of animals still alive to draw inspiration from for these myths. Crocodiles, lizards, snakes, birds, bats. These myths could have arisen from finding dinosaur fossils, but that's not even necessary. George uh, of England that in the year 300 killed a dragon. The picture you're showing looks like it came out of a book. Probably a creationist book considering it has a picture of a dinosaur with the name of a dinosaur underneath it. Like I said, never skeptical of books. And in England we have found uh, fossils of the Baryonyx, a type of dinosaur. I love how you don't even try to link those two things up. There's a legend of a guy killing a dragon. And England has fossils of dinosaurs. Okay, so are you going to try and connect those in any way with any kind of analysis? You know, actual research? No? Okay. Amongst the Aborigines of Australia, they have a number of legends and songs that are thousands of years old in which they describe very clearly large animals in the lakes of Australia that would tip over boats and canoes, eat the people, uh, if there were livestock watering, there they would be eaten, and the description is basically identical with the plesiosaurus, that long-necked marine dinosaur. Okay, stop calling everything a dinosaur. Now, if I give you a massive benefit of the doubt and assume that you actually know what you're talking about when it comes to these aborigine songs and legends, it could be an oarfish, very long, sea serpent -y looking thing. That mainly feeds on zooplankton and stuff, though, so it probably wouldn't be eating people and livestock. Now, since you haven't actually told me what these songs and legends are, all I have to go on is your word, and at this point I don't trust your word, so I'm not going to try guessing any more than this. Suffice to say that your second-hand report of aborigine songs and legends that tell of a long-necked creature that eats people and livestock are not proof that plesiosaurs are still alive. Now, a much more commonly made plesiosaur claim is the Loch Ness Monster, and I'm wondering why you didn't go to Nessie and instead chose this obscure aborigine song and legend thing. And the only answer I can think of is... You don't want to seem silly. It's a bit late for that. Coming a little closer to home here in Mexico, in the state of Guanajuato, uh, to the south, there's a place, a town called Acambaro. And there they have found some 33,000 ceramic figurines, 
most of them made before the time of Christ, many that look very much like dinosaurs. I'm very glad, John, that you gave specific information on these, specifically the town where they were found. This allows me to quickly and easily find the information. Thank you. Unfortunately, by doing that, you've made it too easy to find out that these were likely of recent manufacture. There is so much information if you just Google a Kambaro dinosaur figures. My terrible pronunciation strikes again, and I will leave the exact spelling in the description, and I'll stop discussing this now because there's so much information out there for everybody. Here we have a number of the Ica stones that are well <coughs> uh, cut into the stone and polished, and, and this one you can see dinosaurs in the two of them. Uh, the one here on the right, you can see the legs, the plates on the back, very much as we see in the uh, Stegosaurus, the head, the eye, and a native Peruvian riding on a dinosaur. Here's a picture of one of the Ica stones, that's ICA stones, from Peru. Another known fake. In this case, the creator actually said that he faked them. Go and Google it for yourself once again. And he confessed that in the 70s. You have no excuse for hiding that information, you lying sack of shit. Also in their articles of pottery and cloth, we have drawings too that look like dinosaurs. Alright, let's pretend that you still have any credibility left, and I'll take you at your word that these are actually ancient artifacts found in a Nazca tomb. Now here's a picture of one of the little so-called dinosaurs on the tapestry. Look at this Atari-ass motherfucker, that could be anything. Here, I'll tell you what, it's not a dinosaur, it's this Peruvian hairless dog. Yeah, come on. As for this pottery, you'll notice that the feet are actually backwards. The head is on the tail, not a long neck. So my guess is there's a head on the other side of this pot. And I suspect that if this is real, that head looks a little something like this. Now, let me just make a comment here as we're about to close, that there are basically two reasons why people believe in evolution. I believe it's just basically two. One is because of ignorance. And for that reason, we are making these conferences to get rid of people's ignorance. Oh, that music sounds so good right now. Anyway, John, you have a real funny way of getting rid of people's ignorance. Another reason is, basically, it's to calm their conscience. Either from social pressure, or basically, the idea is this. There is no God. There are no commandments. There is no hell. I'm God. I can do what I please. You know, I know there has to be a third possible reason, but I just can't put my finger on it. People will believe in evolution because it's convenient. It's convenient because of their immoral lifestyle or just to maintain their social standing to keep their job and not to rock the boat. Yeah, you're probably right. Hey, so on an unrelated topic, I have a word of the day calendar. Do you know what the word projection means? Now, I want you to stay in tune with us. We still have many many great really interesting things to share uh there's still stuff hey did dinosaurs go on the ark where are they in the bible are there any alive today oh my fuck can't you please just make your next dinosaur conference about like hey look we found another t-rex isn't that cool you know utah raptor Ooh, scary i mean seriously are dinosaurs alive today from someone who does not believe in evolution how can that possibly not be a disaster why do you have to torture me like this Remember that balloon, keep an open mind. Yeah, dude, trust me. I'll keep an open mind to dinosaurs being alive today, but you're gonna have to do a whole lot better than you did in this video. For example, one suggestion I would have is that rather than showing us hoaxes that have been disproven since the 1970s, you don't show us that. Just a thought. I mean, it doesn't seem to do you much good. We'll see you soon. God bless you. Hopefully you won't see us that soon because I'm hoping that for my next video, I'll find someone different to look at. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of thinking Carl Baugh. We'll see how that goes.